The film kicks off immediately with an acknowledgements card that is fictional, speaking about the incident around Andromeda as if it were real, though, as well as referring to Project Scoop and Wildfire as if they were real things, too. As discussed during the look at the book that this is based upon, the Andromeda strain is presented with the intention of grounding it in reality to an almost anal degree to emphasize that they were actual events rather than a work of fiction. It's not as convincing as the Blair Witch Project, certainly, but I don't think viral marketing was really much of an option in 1971. Like many films of the time, the credits are front-loaded, so after three minutes or so, we get down to the movie itself, with a couple of military types watching the city of Piedmont, Arizona. We can be sure they're on our side, because the Ruskies would never be so desperate. The Cold War is not going to be won by studying a town that can fit onto a particularly large bus. They decide to go check the place out, since the only thing they can see are the buzzards circling. Hmm, nothing ominous about that. Yeah, let's just drive into town without any NBC gear and see what happens. Fendel Decker to Caper 1. What's happened? We see bodies. Lots of them. Are you certain, Caper 1? Oh, you're right. A truck full of mannequins could have tipped over. Of course we're sure. We know what dead people look like. Like live people who've had a particularly bad day. You, you see that thing in white? Yeah, it's coming Hi, I'm the Grim Reaper. I know you were expecting a black robe, but I only wear that after Labor Day. Well, there's a scream, and then nothing. So they decide to check it out with an airplane this time. I'm declaring a state of emergency. All personnel restricted to base. Everything seen and heard in that room is top secret. Yes, sir. If my wife knows we watched that smut, she'd kill me. We're going to have to pass this up the chain of command now. This is pretty big. This is a recording. State your name and your message and hang up. Damn it, the Pentagon is still screening my calls. Those guys are such pricks. At the home of Dr. Stone, his party is interrupted by some armed military men at the door, who won't say anything other than they insist on seeing this woman's husband, and then tell him... There's a fire, sir. Oh, great. Is it VD? I thought the Army made you watch films to ensure that didn't happen. They assure Mrs. Stone that even though they're spiriting her husband away in the middle of the night, there's nothing to worry about here. They're here to protect him, not arrest him. Somehow she is not comforted by that assertion. After all, this is the kind of thing you hear about happening behind the Iron Curtain. So she runs off to call her father the senator, only <laughs> as if to prove that they are living in an authoritarian state. While she's trying to talk to him, the line is cut, a voice comes in saying that she's not allowed to talk about this thing, and hangs up. Oh yeah, I'm sure she's going to sleep real well tonight. Anyway, despite their maximizing the effort to terrorize his wife, they actually are taking care of Dr. Stone. In fact, they've prepped a plane for him, but it's short notice, so they've got a full-size commercial airplane. I mean, the entire thing is empty, save for Mr. Stone and his tiny escort. Or, in other words, what it looks like when Richard Branson goes to the beach for the afternoon. The rest of the team is also answering their Avengers Assemble cry, except for one of them in the hospital who's having an appendectomy. You don't make sense. You talk like you've been brainwashed. You don't understand. The leader said I shouldn't listen to people like you. His wife is upset. Seems upset wives is going to be a theme for this group. But his grandson is excited because men with guns are here, and for kids... That's right up there with robots and dinosaurs. The next member of the team is a change from the book, actually. Dr. Levitt is a woman. And I have to say, her presence improves the dynamic substantially. Her irascible personality is a great contrast to Stone's serious professionalism, Burton's old country doctor vibe, and the as-yet-unmet Hall, the practicing surgeon who finds all of this hard to believe. Well, she's not interested in participating right now. She's in the middle of an experiment. No, too busy to save the world, although not too busy to have a smoke. Her assistant says that Levitt's exhausted, and the spook suggests a physician could verify that she's medically unfit at the moment. But Levitt won't hear of that. She's going to go now. The reason for her decision will be more obvious later on. But that brings us to Hall, who was called out of surgery by order of the president's science advisor, we all know has the power of martial law if necessary. Soon he and Stone are in a helicopter heading to Piedmont in special suits to make sure that they're not killed by any space germs that hitched a ride on the satellite. But the fun is interrupted by a flash forward to a Senate investigation 
into this incident. Now, let's talk about this famous letter Dr. Stone sent to the president some two years ago. Apparently, if we forward it to ten friends, we're supposed to come into some money. He was concerned that the Lunar Laboratory wasn't adequate to protect Earth from the work they were doing, and that was how Stone unwittingly brushed alongside the existing program, Project Scoop, a pretty mundane name for the Herald of the Apocalypse, like finding out the name of the Antichrist is Chad. Well, time to check things out, so Stone and Hall fly to Piedmont to inspect the situation, dressed in full hazmat suits so they don't wind up like Beetle Bailey and Sarge did. But buzzards are a bit of a concern, though, so they decide to gas the town. Our guys will only kill the birds. That's strangely specific. You've got Adam West's utility belt on that helicopter. Maybe going to drop some anti-shark spray while you're at it? So they're dropped off in town and proceed to their important job of looking around and saying, yep, that's a dead guy. The people seem to just collapse right where they were in the middle of whatever they were doing. As they check it out, the screen splits to show glimpses of what they, in turn, are glimpsing. An effective and unique technique. Not surprising given Robert Weiss's background with directing and editing. What they find in one of the places is a surprise, though. A woman who hanged herself, complete with a note. Next is a man who drowned himself, followed by a man whose post-mortem cut has no bleeding. Wonky space bugs, that's for sure. To find the answer, they grab the van and use that to track down the satellite, which is in the office of the town doctor. It's a pretty small town hall. I don't think you're going to find any condoms full of cocaine in there. Have a look at his buttocks. This man clearly has a Stairmaster. The absence of pooled blood there indicates that the blood has clotted through his entire body. I have to think about that. But first, there's the matter of a crying baby, which they track to a nearby house. Stone insists on not feeding the kids, since that could be what killed the others. You don't want to accidentally kill the only survivor. That would look bad. Besides, I'm sure the kid wants food, but you know what I'm sure the kid wants even more? A helicopter ride, huh? The only thing more awesome than a helicopter ride would be a flight in an X-Wing. After Stone hauls the baby up, a second survivor shows up. Ain't no baby. Although he is kind of dressed like one, and I wouldn't be surprised if he wore a diaper out of sheer laziness. He's got a cleaver, but before he can attack with it, the old fart collapses. And that's the end of the threat he poses. Unless you count his body funk. As they vacate the town, Stone says that he wants the president to authorize a 712. Like a 711, but fewer Slim Jims and more gamma rays. Turns out a 712 is a nuclear strike. Well, the president is hesitant to order a nuclear strike on his own country, believe it or not. So he orders a quarantine around the town instead while they think it over. That's all right, though. There's another nuke at Wildfire itself. Although not the launch it at someone kind, thankfully. It's the blow ourselves up kind. Like the end of Beneath the Planet of the Apes, only without destroying the entire world. It's just our own little corner of it. Think global, atomized local. Meanwhile, we're following Levitt and Dutton, who are arriving at Wildfire by car, over a dirt road made solely to cover up all the heavy machinery tracks that was used to build Wildfire out here. You're lost. No one's been down this goat path for years. That's how it's supposed to look. They spent $50,000 on it. Putting in the potholes? Logical. Perfectly. Where's our leader? We'll catch up to him and Hall very soon now. Why they pick Hall? He's no scientist. Who needs an overpriced MD? Relax and enjoy your cigarette. It's your last. Oh, I hope that doesn't make her get cranky. At the end of the road is a USDA research facility. That's the cover for wildfire. It explains the presence of personnel and deliveries made out to this place without arousing suspicion. We were going to use the bathroom, but we kept sending people down by mistake. So, now that we're all here... We can get to work summoning the Super Friends. Stone is unhappy because he's been waiting for a message about this catastrophe, and the guy at the desk, 
whose job consists solely of listening for a bell to ring, says it hasn't rung so far, so all he can do is shrug at him. Shrugging is his other job. But it's high time we got down to that bomb I mentioned a little while ago. Stone gives a key to Hall and explains that he better keep it on him at all times. The other one gets inserted into a special lock, which now arms the nuke. As he explains, the bomb is going to go off automatically if it detects that a hostile disease is going to escape the wildfire facility. Better to nuke the place than allow the germ to get out and destroy the world. But just in case we don't need to eliminate billions of dollars in material and kill numerous top-level geniuses, say, if it's a mistake or someone accidentally dumped their yogurt on a sensor or something, Hall has the key that will turn the nuke off. He gets it because of the single-man hypothesis, that an unmarried man makes the best decisions on what to do with nukes, though it also is established that he makes the worst decisions on what to do with a baby shower. It's of vital importance, Hall, that you always know where you are in relation to the nearest substation. To do that, you have to be familiar with the entire facility. It can be studied on this electronic diet. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Which rotates to afford an overall view. Or can be stopped at any section. Remember, these are very high-tech visual effects for 1971. Douglas Trumbull had made a name for himself for his contributions to 2001 A Space Odyssey, so he decided to start his own special effects company, and this was its first film. He severely under-budgeted, though, and nearly went out of business. But this film's success would actually allow him to do work on the film's silent running, so that worked out for him in the end. Well, thanks to Trumbull's special effects, Stone is now able to provide an info dump on all their technology. One way you can always locate yourself or any of this instantly, simply by calling up projections from the electronic diagram on any video monitor anywhere in Wildfire. Views such as this. <laughs> that, that wrong switch here. Let me just try to find the right one. Now, this shows we're in conference room 7, level 1. Each of us is indicated by our initials. Our movements are continuously monitored on the electronic diagram. Nixon is the president, after all. Are you sure the old man and the baby are still alive? Of course. I poked holes in the top of the jars. Well, now is the time to get moving, and that requires decontamination. Thorough, thorough decontamination. You are about to undergo long-wave radiation. A buzzer will sound. Close your eyes and stand still, or blindness may result. Next, we'll iron all those nasty wrinkles out of your brains. After this, it's the body analyzer. Please answer the following questions, yes or no. Have you any allergies? Yes, to ragweed pollen. She is going to love Siri. Her reaction to technology is exactly the same as my wife's. Okay, I'll repeat for your memory cells. Please repeat your response for our memory cells. Ragweed pollen! Wonder what's next? Contact on all leads is R for ready. Now, tell me about your father. After still more tests... <laughs> just remember, it's all in the name of science. Make sure the helmet is firmly seated and the visor lowered. Then raise your arms and wait. Or possibly disco. Please replace the helmet in compartment and proceed through shower in next room. Then you may dress and descend to level four. Next is the gynecology exam. 